Howdy. Uh, there we go, separating hype from reality. Uh, you know, the genesis for this talk came a few months ago when I was off in London at uh, something called the Barclays, Barclays Distributed Banking Summit. And I thought it was really interesting how, you know, I was in a room with 40, 50 odd bankers, a lot of them actually very tech focused um, from the IT departments as well as the finance departments. And here we are trying to go wrap our heads around Bitcoin. And especially not just Bitcoin, the currency, but also what can we do with blockchains? What can we do with consensus? And it kind of led to uh, this one. Smart contracts, what the heck are they? And to be honest with you, I mean, we sat down like for a good three hours trying to wrap our heads around, well, what the heck is a smart contract? And the conclusion was pretty much we don't know. And we do know if it did exist, we would need trusted oracles to make it happen. What's a trusted oracle? Some person with computer who enters in things like stock prices and you know, makes cryptographic statements about it. Point is, it's trusted third party, it's not magic. And that's really what it comes down to. You know, just because something's on a blockchain doesn't make it real. And as much as we would like it to be true, blockchains are just data. They're just accounting systems. You know, really bits don't know anything about the real world. They can't affect the real world directly. To affect the real world, we have to have social consensus around it. We have to have some mechanism of influencing the real world. Uh, as an example, I mean, as much as I kind of made fun of smart contracts, one of the people I did go meet at Barclays, um, Primavera de, I can't even begin to pronounce her last name, some French name, but uh, I was talking to her the other day at another conference, and they kind of wrapped their head around, well, what could we do with this? Well, why don't we just go fill out legal forms? Why don't we go take the data in our blockchain and create something that we can go give to lawyers? Literally a stack of paper that they can check off in the same way that, as it turns out, uh, stock uh, trades, for instance. Again, a stock trade is really just accounting ledger, you know, entries in accounting system, and they have legal meaning because we sign a contract to begin with and we, and we essentially agree in advance that if this comes to court, we'll go print out some forms and fill in the right numbers in the right place. Another issue we uh, kind of kept running into at Barclays, global consensus. Bitcoin's very good with global consensus because ultimately we want to know around the entire world, have you spent money once? If we don't have global consensus about it, I can give two different people the same Bitcoins and that's rather problematic. But in so many applications, you don't actually need global consensus. You know, you can go get away with local notions. You can go get away with things that are really close to standard cryptographic systems. A good example is voting. You know, do you need to know elsewhere in the world exactly what votes or people are, um, are submitting in a completely different election? No, the people in one country need to know what the votes are and people in another country don't. And so many of these Bitcoin 2.0 notions we were kind of banding about, they kind of kept getting shot down. Well, do we really need this sort of consensus? Another issue we came down to, identity and reputation. Uh, that quote there, uh, the Bobcat, it kind of comes from a friend of mine, Andrew Miller. And he's a researcher off at uh, Maryland University and he's been thinking a lot about how do you compute reputation in a really hardcore mathematical way. And he likes to use this example, did I mail you drugs or a Bobcat? To really talk about, well, in the most pure sense, Suppose I'm on the Silk Road, nobody else knows who I am, and I go claim that some dealer went and mailed me some drugs. Or they should have mailed me some drugs, I should say, and instead they sent me a package with a bobcat in it. I would much rather have drugs than a vicious bobcat, so I'm gonna give you a negative reputation. And this is such a pure example because it's purely based on digital data and as it turns out, it's extremely hard to come up with a system where you both have reputation that works 
end also, you don't create opportunities for me to say submit false, uh, false claims about what someone did to go destroy their reputation. Andrew Miller's pretty much thrown up his hands at the problem and applied some pretty shaky uh, social conventions that, you know, if you ask him, he's not really sure are gonna work. But interesting research problem. It's not something you want to go base a product on. And if, you know, you're, if you're starting up a Bitcoin 2.0 thing, which is identity and reputation in, well, I can't really give you good advice because we don't really know how this works. Another big issue that kind of came up, uh, you've probably heard a piece of software that you can go log into a website with your Bitcoin key. And I think what this kind of comes down to is people's first exposure to public key crypto is often through Bitcoin. I mean, how many of you in this audience never even knew what public key crypto was until you first got your Bitcoin wallet? Let's, let's see, put up your hands. Ah, the audience is too interested. Uh, you're all experts, but uh, you know, at Barclays, we certainly had this problem. And I kind of kept having to remind people, you know, these problems you're trying to go solve have been solved before. They may not be involved money the first time around, but you know, you shouldn't necessarily view everything through this window of Bitcoin. You know, go do some research prior to Bitcoin. And again, voting is one of these examples too. Voting's kind of a pet, uh, a pet cryptographic project. Everyone who kind of goes and gets a PhD in crypto, at some point they probably thought, how am I gonna make voting better? And this has been around for, you know, 20 years. It's uh, very much pre-Bitcoin. Another notion, um, implicit trust is still trust. People often forget the Bitcoin system is not as trustless as we would like it to be. We would much rather it be based purely on math, but it's not. It's really reliant on mining. And ultimately, you trust miners to do their job. The beauty of Bitcoin is that we set up a set of economic incentives that hopefully encourages miners to behave a certain way which is to extend the blockchain, not try to reorganize it, not allow double spends and so on. But that's economic incentives, it's not math. With most of crypto, I can go make statements like, all right, to go break this private key and sign a bad signature, I'd you know, say I have to go take the sun, build a giant supercomputer, run it for a couple billion years and try to crack it. And if I just double the key size, I won't be able to do that anymore. With Bitcoin, it's more like, I don't know, why don't I go and maybe talk to those guys on the mining panel and uh, hold a gun to their heads. It's a lot weaker. In, I show uh, Blockstream as an example. They're working on sidechains. Many aspects of sidechains I think are quite good. I mean, I'm working on sidechain implementation myself. Merge mine sidechains, to make a long story short, it involves mining in a very specific way, and it adds a lot of incentives to mining. And already mining, it's kind of dodgy whether or not it works. So by adding more complexity to the incentives, can you reason about it? I'm not sure. At Barclays, there are tons of ideas. Let's go and make people mine predictions in the blockchain. Does this stuff work? We don't, we don't really know. And it's very hard to evaluate it. And well, what does this really boil down to? Bitcoin does work, but it's a special case. It's not real. When I go send you bitcoins, I don't need to trace it back to something real because we all agree that bitcoins are valuable and you can kind of say the, the effect of my action of sending you bitcoins ends there. And so much of bitcoin 2.0 stuff, it's well, how can we go beyond that? How can we do something else with bitcoin? And right away you're kind of moving into realms which do interface with reality do interface with an on-digital, and that's where you run into a lot of problems. So what's Bitcoin 1.5? It's kind of become my catch-all term of, well, let's go take Bitcoin 1.0. How can we upgrade it? How can we build on it? How can we go do things with it that are real and concrete and can happen in the next one to two years? And I kind of developed sort of a set of uh, design principles, set of mental checklists to evaluate ideas. First and foremost, I mean, let's remember, Bitcoin is still great at moving money around. In the near term, and we saw it yesterday, uh, 
hub and spoke micropayments. Long story short, their way of collapsing multiple Bitcoin transactions into one. Um, yesterday, Jeff Garzik in his talk uh, mentioned how BitPay is rolling out implementation of that. And I think that's a great, great near term thing. And it'll be coming down the pipeline, you know, the next few months, next year or so. Also, there's this idea of accounting 2.0. Well, what's accounting 1.0? Let's go back to about the 1300s when the first people were creating double entry accounting systems. I believe those um, in, in uh, Italy. And when you think about it, imagine you're in Italy in the 1300s and I'm trying to decide whether or not I can trust someone else's business to have accurate records of their money so I may want to invest in them. Prior to double entry accounting, I couldn't even evaluate what they were doing. I couldn't audit what they were doing. I pretty much had to just trust them. Double entry accounting, while it didn't automate the process of determining whether or not I could go trust another party, it did at least give me the tools to do it. And then that's continued on for a couple hundred years, and now we have crypto. What does crypto do beyond counting 1.0? It automates it. And something very real we did come up with at Barclays and elsewhere is, well, why don't we go open books up? Why don't we use crypto to automate all this accounting? Why should it be a multi-day process to simply update ledgers from one bank to another to move money around? I mean, on one level, yeah, that's kind of boring. It's not identity on the blockchain, but it works. And we know we can do this. And yes, when the counting system spits out something went wrong, you're still going to have to call up a lawyer. But it's still a huge improvement. At least it makes, gives you clarity as to what's really happened. Another design principle of mine, embrace trust, but verify it. And I think this ties into, again, accounting. It's OK to go trust people, but you have to understand what's the dynamics of that trust. And I would much rather be in a position where I'm explicitly trusting someone to do something, but know exactly how I can verify that they're doing what they should be, than if I'm in a position where there's a sort of vague, implicit trust and I'm not really sure what's going on. Case in point, if I'm going to trust Bitstamp to hold on my Bitcoins, I don't want to be in a position where I don't know whether or not they have any still in their vault. But I'm not going to feel so bad if I'm in a position where I can go audit them on a real-time basis automatically to know that they still have my money. And I'm also going to feel a lot better about that than I'm if in some strange Bitcoin 2.0 side chain where I'm kind of waving my hand and saying, I really hope those miners are honest and haven't decided to go bandy together and steal my money. Because I don't know who that group is. I know who Bitstamp is, sort of. But I can make much, I can make much better, more reasoned statements about that. So embrace trust explicitly. Issued assets is something near and dear to my heart because I'm actually working on software to do this. And I think it's kind of a special case of accounting plus embracing trust. If I have a digital token that represents really a digital bearer certificate, I know if I go to some real world entity, I can say, you promise to go give me gold when I give you this back. The counting records as well as the software, let me know 90% of that. I know exactly who has what. I know the bearer certificate I have is real. And I know the one thing that I am trusting is that they will, in fact, cough up the gold. Maybe not to me, maybe to someone who I might go sell that bearer certificate to. Having said that, you don't necessarily need global consensus for this. Counterparty and MasterCoin are a good example. I mean, I used to be MasterCoin's chief scientist, and the software model for that was scanned through the whole blockchain. Well, again, why do I need to know other people's transactions? I'd much rather have a simple proof that what I have is real. I don't care about anyone else's work, and that's why I'm working on something called proof chains. As the name might suggest, it's a chain of proofs from one movement to another. I'd say that's a great example of Bitcoin 1.5. I know what the trust is, it's local, and it's based on simple, easy to verify math. Big design principle of mine, can I explain it to a fine arts grad? 
And there's two, two aspects to this. I mean, first of all, don't overestimate how well you yourself understand systems. You know, if you go work on something simple enough, you can explain it in easy, easily accessible terms, chances are you understand it well enough to go find the flaws in it. Whereas if you're trying to go build a system at the edge of your own understanding, who's to say it really works? Who's to say you haven't missed something? Now, I'm a little biased here having a fine arts degree myself, along with half a physics degree and half a comp sci degree, but it certainly served me well to stick to systems that I can very rigorously define, explain, and feel like I understand, rather than systems where I'm kind of hand-waving away a lot of the complexity. With smart contracts, I felt a lot better when I was talking to my friend Primavera and we were saying, yeah, there's a system, we did this prototype, it has a PHP website, and it spits out a big stack of legal documents, and we have a nice agreement. That was very concrete, it was easy to understand, it was accounting software. I know how accounting software works, she knows how accounting software works. And she could convince me, yeah, this is real. Equally think like an attacker. And in crypto, it's not enough to go create a demo. If you just create a demo, for all you know, the thing that verifies a message could simply be returned true. And it's only gonna, you're only gonna know if it really works if you put it in the real world and have people try to attack it. Or if you put it in front of a bunch of your peers and have them try to attack it. You know, when I go look at an uh, example of MadeSafe, StoreJ, all these systems to decentralize file storage, I mean, I've got a lot of criticism of them, and they all boil down to attacks. It's not that they don't work if everyone plays nice. It's do they work if people try to attack them? In the same way that it took a very long time for Bitcoin to get any consensus that it might have worked because it was so obviously based on human incentives. It seems to still work, but I'm certainly not going to want to go down the path of having even more dodgy criteria. And if you're thinking like an attacker, you should be going through the list and every time you think, well, no, maybe this could be broken. Maybe there's some economic exploit I could have. Maybe I could dump a pile of data on this and make it unprofitable to run. You know, that should all be red flags to you. If it's not really clear what it's doing, if it's not really clear where the tax might be, it's again, red flags. So thank you.